Tonight's program is a conversation about Norman Mailer, inspired by the release of Library of America's recent double anthology of his work, edited by Michael J. Lennon. Here to talk about Mailer's enduring legacy are Mike Lennon, Maureen Corrigan, and Tony Smith. Lennon is Emeritus Professor of English at Wilkes University. He's Norman Mailer's archivist, editor, and authorized biographer, and president of the Norman Mailer Society. And I just found out that he also has Norman Mailer's teeth. <laughs> His books include Norman Mailer, A Double Life, and Selected Letters of Norman Mailer. Maureen Corrigan, book critic for NPR's Fresh Air, is the Nikki and Jamie Grant Distinguished Professor of the Practice in Literary Criticism at Georgetown University. She is an associate editor of and contributor to Mystery and Suspense Writers and the winner of the 1999 Edgar Award for Criticism presented by the Mystery Writers of America. Corrigan served as a juror for the 2012 Pulitzer Prize in Fiction and was one of the voices instrumental in helping to build this museum. And a And, and if you didn't notice, you can go watch her in the middle uh, circle of those screens in the other room. And tonight's conversation is moderated by reporter Tony Smith, a broadcast journalist, meteorologist, and board member of the National Association of Black Journalists, Chicago chapter. Professor Lennon will be available to sign the books tonight after the program. And thank you all for coming. And I'm going to hand it over to... All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. Um, we're... I, I, I met these two earlier and I feel like we're gonna be wowed on, on tonight. So but let's get right to it. Here we are at 632. For the most part, can you guys explain the editing process of this book? You know, like it was, it's a lot. You know, I, I had a week to read it and I was just wowed and I was just sitting there turning the pages and I was like, my mouth started to drop because as a millennial, like, yeah, we don't read the books anymore. We walk around with these. But actually had to sit there and, and just dive in. And I dived in and explain this editing process. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, Library of America tries to publish the, a, uh, an utterly reliable edition of the great works of American writers. And these were, I think, number 307 and 308 of the books they've been publishing since around 1970. They do about 20 titles a year. And so they go to people who know a lot about uh, an author, and they say, would, would you help us select which books we should publish? With Mailer, it was particularly difficult because he would write a novel, then he would write nonfiction, then he'd write a biography, then he'd do a sports book, then he'd do journalism, political journalism. And so it, it wasn't, with John Updike, you know, you could say, all right, here are his novels from this period, and then his novels from this period and work your way through them. And the same with Philip Roth. With Mailer, it was a lot trickier. And we argued for, not argued, just discussed for a long time the way to do it. And I was kind of interested in the generic way. Let's do the biographies of Mailer. Let's do the nonfiction. Let's do the fiction. And uh, we kicked it around for a long time. And they finally made a very compelling argument, which was, it's time to do the 60s. This is the time to do the 60s. The events of the 60s. Uh, reverberate through the decade that we're in now. And it might have been Mailer's best decade. And so uh, what we have here is a potpourri of two volumes. One has two novels and two nonfiction books. Uh, and the ones we're going to talk about tonight are Miami and the Siege of Chicago, about the events of 50 years ago this week in, in, this, in this great city. Uh, and the other one was The Armies of the Night, which was about the march in the Pentagon in 1967 that Mailer was involved with. And then there were two novels he wrote in that period. The other volume has all of Mailer's essays, most of them uh, published in other books, in three or four other books. And the process then was to pick the best essays that he wrote during the 60s. And he wrote an awful lot of them, a lot of journalism. We ended up with 32, or th I think 32 or 33 essays. And so selecting them was really the hardest job. And then trying to determine which do you use. Do you use the original one that appeared in a magazine? Do you use the one that was reprinted in a book by him in which he made changes? Do you use the one that later on in another book by him where he put together all of his stuff in one gigantic 1,200 page book? That one where he made still further changes. And there are always people who are writing titles for the works of authors when they write for magazines. And so they weren't really his title. So whose title do you use? 
So we had to wrestle with all those questions and try to get the right one. And um, then we had to, you know, just do the kind of grunt work of identifying every person in the nonfiction books. Who were they? And a lot of them are old governors who were at political conventions in 1964 that, you know, would not be easily remembered. And so that was kind of the uh, slogging through, through uh, the Internet to find all that information and learning a lot as I went along. That's, that was the process. Wow. And speaking of that process, Maureen, what did, how did he do? How did they do? <laughs> well, I, I was interested, Tony, when you said you sat down for a week and read this. And I was trying to think about what that experience is like, what it was like for me to go back and reread Miami and the Siege of Chicago and just be bathed in this language. I mean, it is so alive. It's so crazy. It's like, what is this language do for you that say watching the clips that probably a lot of us have been watching uh, from 50 years ago the last few days to be with Mailer as he's sifting through this kaleidoscope of events around him um, it, it, it's just so fabulous to be in his company and I can't imagine editing Mailer I mean I, I, I'm so glad I didn't have your job but I'm so happy I, ha I have the job of being a reader and appreciating just the gusto. I, I, I think I asked you this in, in an email, Mike, and you, you didn't, maybe you didn't really realize that it was a question, but when I read Mailer, I keep thinking, this guy loved to write, you know? It, it just seems like he could have written 12 sentences for every sentence that landed on the page and they would have all been great. Did he, did he enjoy writing? He liked it when he, was, when he got into the process. He had to crank himself up. But once he got a routine going, he would work. And he would work very, very hard. Double shifts in many cases until 9 o'clock at night. Many people think Mailer just spent a lot of his time in bar rooms and getting in trouble on television shows and things like that. And he did. But he was really a very hard worker. Miami and the Siege of Chicago was written in two weeks. 75,000 words. And uh, the armies of the night took about uh, six weeks. And so you can make a case, in fact, you made it, Maureen, earlier, that some of his best writing is not the books he labored on for 10 years, but the books that he wrote under deadline pressure. He was a terrific deadline writer. And he loved that, the challenge. And they'd say, OK, Life magazine needs 25,000 words on Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier. And you know we go, we go to press every week. We've got to have it. And he would turn them in. Uh, he wrote once wrote 18,000 words in 72 hours for uh, Life magazine for one of the Muhammad Ali's fights. So he did like it to that extent that he could really throw himself in it. And he was almost like a, uh, a decathlon uh, event of a kind where you go, how much can you write in one particular day? And then also had to do the research. And then he had to read the drafts. He would wear his secretaries out. He'd have two secretaries typing. And they'd be, when he got finished writing for the day, they'd, they'd feed him the drafts, and he would go over the drafts and make the corrections. So there's a stream of drafts coming back to him all the time. Uh, and probably when he turned in those books, they'd gone through four drafts in, in, in two weeks as well. Wow. I just can't believe, you know, he's my kind of man. You know, being in TV, dealing with those deadlines, I got to tell you. But, yeah, I wish I would have known him. But I feel like I'm getting to know him. Um, now, speaking of you know, this book and the parallels. Do we see any of that today? Like in, in this writing, like I was envisioning a few things, but what about you two? Well, you know, a phrase sticks in my mind. Uh, one historian has talked about our current age as the age of fragmentation. And I feel like I'm, when I'm rereading these essays, I'm seeing where it started, you know, 1967, Mar Armies of the Night, 68, these events. This, this is when America is really starting to come apart at the seams. And you see Mailer in, in these, these two books, two long essays, really trying to 
I don't know, almost witness it. I don't know if he, he doesn't really come to conclusions, which is part of the strength of his writing, but, but witnessing, you know, you, you, you've got the new left, you, you've got the old Republicans, you've got the old Democrats, you know, you, you've got the intellectuals, you've got the trade unionists. You're the hippies and the, the yippies, yippies and the Black yeah, Panthers. Yeah, all of them. And, um, you know, I always, I always love that Mailer, Oh, his his discomfort with Eugene McCarthy. What does he call his, his followers? Disinfected idealists. I mean, these phrases they just jump out. But certainly, as as he's looking at, looking at this scene in front of him of just the fragmented society. Well, we can we can just draw the line to the present and. I, I, I think he's looking in, in almost a visionary way, although maybe he doesn't realize it. He's looking forward to what we're we're wrestling with today. You think of in '68, you know, Andy Warhol was shot one day. Robert Kennedy shot the next day. A month before that, LBJ said he wasn't going to run for president again. You had riots in the street uh, after uh, Martin Luther King was killed. I mean, the the string of events. Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and two Kennedys and I mean Andy Warhol was uh, his the shooting of Andy Warhol was lost because Bobby Kennedy's death happened the next day. I mean, I'm sure that, I know there's a lot of people in this room that remember those weeks and they were they were utterly stunning. And Mailer, you know, felt that it was his obligation to to be a witness and 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 to essentially testify on what was happening. And he had models from people in the past. Uh, from some of the great writers in the past that witnessed things, Mencken, H.L. Mencken, uh, and Dreiser, and people like that who had witnessed the great events, and uh, Henry Adams. And he, they were very much on his mind when he was writing his books. He knew who, somebody said, you know, uh, I think it was uh, the guy that ran the Washington Post, Philip Graham, that journalism is the first draft of history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Mela's book <laughs> may be the last draft. We, we will rely on armies of the night to tell us what happened in Chicago 50 years ago more than any other document, I think. You know, I, I, I just want to add to that timeline. Since I live with a historian, my husband reminded me that, what was it, a month before LBJ resigned, Cronkite comes on national news and says about Vietnam, we're, we're in a mess. You know, and there's you know, the great white father Saying, throwing up his hands and saying to America, "We don't, you know, we don't know what we're doing." What a moment that must have been. I mean, I was 13 at the time, so I don't, I don't have those same kind of whatever young adult memories that that you have. But it, I mean, I just think that must have been um, earth shattering, given the prominence that somebody like Cronkite had at the time. Well. The people in the audience here, I mean, you all remember Vietnam, a lot of you, I can tell by looking out there at the white hair. You remember Vietnam, you know? I mean, it went on and on and on and on. It just didn't seem it was ever, ever going to stop. You know, somebody said uh, when Mailer went to Washington for the armies of the night, uh, Abby Hoffman and uh, Jerry Rubin said, we're going to levitate the Pentagon. We're going to make it rise in the air and turn around six times and disappear. And someone said, well, why not? Nothing else seems to work to get rid of the war in Vietnam. Why not try that? It can't hurt. And of course, they did try to levitate it. You know, it's a very, very funny scene in Armies of the Night when they out demons out and they chant and they, you know, blow incense and Allen Ginsberg is there with his symbols. And uh, we don't have as much of that zaniness. There was that the zany period when you had, you know, people like Abby Hoffman and, and Jerry Rubin and, and, and the Fugs uh, the, around doing all that crazy stuff. Now, it seems, I, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, is it, things don't seem as funny anymore. No, it seems gr more grim. Speaking of now and versus then, how do you think young activism today kind of translates to now to then? I think, uh, well, you know, the politics in this book, really, the Democratic politics was up from the bottom. I mean, the old Democratic Party was dying, and it was the young people who were doing it. 
Uh, they were pr the hippies and the yippies and a lot of, and you know, the SDS and the, you know, uh, the anti-war movement, uh, the Black Power movement, all those movements were going on. Unfortunately, they, when the violence happened, you know, after the violence happened in Chicago and the polls went out, uh, even though it had been called a police riot in the Walker Report, majority of, a majority of Americans were on the side of the police. And so, the, 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 looking back, many people feel middle-class Americans were alienated by too much violence, too much craziness, you know. And Mailer was, in the book. He's, he's ambivalent about these young protesters because they're saying, well, let's put LSD in the water. He's going, wait a minute, now that's, this is not a great idea, you know. Uh, vote, vote pig, uh, they nominated a pig for president. Well, at a certain point, you know, serious people with serious political instrument interests thought this was crazy. Now we've got the, you know, we've got uh, the Occupy movement, we've got Resist movement, we've got the, the, the kids who are the, the uh, guns in school uh, protesting against that. But there's no common front. Uh, not that the, not that it was, it was pretty splintered then. But there is no common front, less of a common front. I mean, when they marched at the Pentagon. I mean, somehow they got, you know, 100,000 people under one banner when it was all against the war in Vietnam, pulled them all together, even though they had, you know, all their different interests beside that. I don't see, well, maybe there's one thing that a lot of people are against. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Well, when, you know, to go back to that age of fragmentation idea, it's also the age of identity politics. So everybody is sort of gathered in their own camp I mean, you see some of that here, or some of that beginning, but as you say, that the, the so the uniting under a common umbrella of of aims and aspirations that seems more difficult today. That also, you know, the the fact that we are in this age of fragmentation, I think, also explains why Mailer isn't as popular today, or is isn't at read as much today. You know, he's he really as. You know better than anyone in this room, Mike. I mean, he's, he's branded, he's a hard sell to classes. I teach him in some of my classes at Georgetown, but he really, you know, he, I really have to do a lot of prep work to say, well, yes, he did stab one of his wives and, you know, <laughs> you know blah, blah, blah. You know, you really have to make the case for Mailer in a way that at the time he was writing this, he, he didn't have to make the case for himself. No, his books just, the people would just line up at the stores to buy his books in those days uh, because they knew there was someone with intelligence who could write seriously about all the people and knew them. I mean, Mailer knew a lot of the, he knew Gene McCarthy very well. He was very friendly with McCarthy. He admired McCarthy and didn't admire everything about him, as you point out. He didn't admire the fact that McCarthy wasn't really, didn't look like he was trying anymore. It looked like he was in love with defeat. And uh, I think that was, you know, a part of it. Whereas Hubert Humphrey was just the opposite. And Humphrey got the nomination, and we all know what followed after that. So, so do you think we learned anything from now to then? Well, for a long time after, uh, after Vietnam, there was this feeling, I mean, we don't ever want to go to war again. We don't ever want to go to war again. And there was a lot of talk about the peace dividend all the money we were spending on the armed forces and nuclear weapons. And for a long period of time, we were closing down the nuclear weapons and the, we, we eliminated the draft. Probably one of the most, if we had a draft on now, we would not have wars going on in Afghanistan. We would not have the war going on in Iraq, which have, are going on longer than, uh, than the war in Vietnam. We would not have that if, if the draft was on now. I went in the service. And my brother, who's here, we went in the service because, uh, you know, if you didn't join, you were going to get drafted. Either way, you could go to Canada if you wanted to, uh, but a lot of people went in. And um, these days, that, that option is, uh, is, is not there anymore. I'm, I didn't like the idea of the draft, but now I look back on it with a little bit of nostalgia. I mean, it was a really leveling thing to go in the service and meet people from the South, the North, every race, color, gender, part of the country, it was really a, a, a really an education for a, a millions, of, uh, millions of men. Well, Mike and I have been talking a little bit about an essay, a, an essay we both admire that's coming out in the New Yorker this week, yeah. but that you 
turned me on to by David Denby, and he about Miami and the siege of Chicago, and he ends his essay by saying, "Well, that's certainly." He says it was the worst time in American history, recent American history, and that we're living in the second to worst time now, so that we can maybe take heart from reading this that will come through. Uh, Let me read the last. This yeah. is the end of the, the essay by David Denby in The New Yorker. Uh, and he's talking about uh, Mailer, was, Mailer had arguments with the, with the Black Power movement, with the Black Panthers. And uh, he says, uh, what Mailer had to say would be of zero significance were it not for what follows on the next page of Miami and the Siege of Chicago. Blacks, Mailer writes, were trying to make whites guilty. But how guilty? This is Mela speaking. Since obsessions dragoon our energy by endless repetitive contemplations of guilt, we can neither measure nor forget, political power of the most frightening sort was obviously waiting for the first demagogue who would smash the obsession and free the white man of his guilt. Torrents of energy would be loosed. Yes, those same torrents which Hitler had freed in the Germans when he exploded their 10-year obsession with whether they had lost the First World War through betrayal or through material weakness. Through betrayal, Hitler had told them. That's the end of him. And then this is the last paragraph. The premonition of Donald Trump and what Trump has loosed in his audience was written exactly 50 years ago. At the moment, not one word of it seems excessive. Miami and the Siege of Chicago was composed at the worst time in our national life, through the though the current moment is a close second. Reading it gives not only pleasure of a literary sort, but strength and solace. If the country could survive 1968, it will survive Donald Trump, too. <laughs> and that's coming from me. Like, uh, wow. So how did you first encounter Mailer? Like, you got a reminisce and like, oh, you just stumbled on it? I, I think I did just stumble over. I, I was um, in. I was the editor of my high school newspaper, <laughs> and it, it was it was the age of new journalism. You know, I, um, so let's see. I graduated high school in '73. I mean, it, it it was it was picking up. Certainly, it was out there. So I was reading people like Ken Kesey and you know Mailer, um, Tom Wolfe. I, I was I was. I love the idea that you, as a journalist, which I at the point at that point I thought I wanted to be, that you could put yourself into the story, and that the story could be more than just, you know, sticking to just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. So I really loved their writing. I loved the energy of it. I think I read Armies of the Night and Miami and the Siege of Chicago pretty early. I love and and the. The earlier uh, pieces that Mailer wrote about the 1960, um, you know, Democratic Convention, I, I really loved those pieces, and I, I love, you know, I was a nice Catholic schoolgirl. I loved his the fact that he seemed like he would say anything, and he could get away with it because he was funny and sassy, and that's an American voice, that voice, that voice that's funny and irreverent and. God. Obscene, obscene as well. Yeah, and obscene, yeah. <laughs> he loved the notion of uh, ob obscenity as part of humor, and he felt that if it was done correctly, he hated the you know just wholesale swear words. He thought that was ridiculous, but if it was used adroitly and deftly, obscenity could be extremely funny. And this was a time when you could not use any four-letter words, and so there was always Mailer was always having big battles with the New Yorker. When was he going to be able to say F-U-C-K in the New Yorker? And they kept, he kept trying, and they kept saying no. Well, now, of course, that's, that, that's gone by the board now. Uh, there's not much that you can't say anymore. But yeah, his, uh, his, his humor and his sassiness and his obscenity and uh, his daring I, really engaged me when I was a young man. Oh, I was just going to say, you can't say it on NPR. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're still very polite. <laughs> Well, speaking of this, his essays, any one particular sticks out to you the most? Like, if you had that 
one you just had to read it again? Well, I think I, I think Superman comes to the supermarket that Mailer wrote about Jack Kennedy when he uh, in 1960, and it came out just before the 60 election. Has always been one of my favorites because Mailer immediately saw that one of the reasons Jack Kennedy was so attractive is that he looked like a movie star, and he had a tan on him and those flashing white teeth. And Mela saw him in, at the convention in, in uh, Los Angeles being carried in on the shoulders of all these people and uh, like he was a bullfighter. It just, just uh, had a big, a big victory in the bullring. And he realized that there was something different going on here. And of course, he had a beautiful, talented wife as well. And so, you know, this was after eight years of Eisenhower, Mamie and Ike, who, you know, are pretty staid characters. And uh, Jack Kennedy was not. And he had that remote air about him, Kennedy. Mela said he looked like, he looked like a young English professor who was kind of detached and, and looked like he was trying to figure out some problem in his PhD thesis and he wasn't sure about it. And, 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 and he looked, he had that kind of, uh, you know, he wasn't in your face. Kennedy always had that little slight remoteness about him as well as his good looks and his sense of humor too. Kennedy had a great wit as well. Uh, great wit. And so they were, they were a team that was made in heaven, uh, Jack Kennedy and Mailer. And on the strength of that, Mailer decided he was going to run for mayor of New York. Uh, he said, that, you know, he said, why not? And he tried to get his family to do it. He said, well, the, you, all the Kennedy family helped, helped him. Why won't you help me? <laughs> and they all thought he was crazy. And he was uh, at the time. He was going to run on the existentialist ticket. And of course, there was no existentialist party uh, in New York, it never was, and so on. And so they realized then, and then he cracked up after that. But it was Kennedy who mobilized him. Mailer had never voted in an election since he voted for uh, FDR in the 1940s, in 1944. He had not voted in any election. He was completely alienated. He was a beatnik. You know, he was living in Greenwich Village. But Kennedy brought him back into American political life. Can't follow that, <laughs> but you know, Mike, you quoted a little bit of, of his description of JFK, and I think that's that's another thing about Mailer's writing that um, I don't know if we're going to get to it, so I'll just jump in. But but the the word Dickensian is applied to to these character portraits that he's giving us in just one sentence, two sentences. Mike and I had to have a, a preparatory glass of wine before coming over here tonight, you know, kind of in the, in the imagined mailer style. And we were, we were just throwing these lines at each other, you know, David Eisenhower looking like he would play Billy Budd in a high school <laughs> production. <laughs> you, you just, you just you, where did, I, I don't know, I just, I'm, my mouth drops open in awe. There, there's nothing stale or canned uh, the sentences never end in a place that I expect them to. It's just so fresh. And, um, Shall I give him the, yeah, the yeah. Hubert Humphrey? Yes. This is a description of Hubert Humphrey when Humphrey has accepted the Democratic nomination in 68. And Mailer was not a big fan of Humphrey, but he said, um, um, <clears throat> Humphrey had a face which was as dependent upon cosmetics as the protagonist of a coffin. The results were about as dynamic. Makeup on Hubert's face somehow suggested that the flesh beneath was the color of putty. It gave him a shaky, put-together look of a sales manager in a small corporation who takes a drink to get up in the morning, and another drink after he has made his intercom calls, the sort of man who is not proud of drinking, and so in the coffee break he goes into the john and throws a sen sen down his throat. All day he exudes odors all over, sen sen, lime water, pomade, bay rum, deodorant, talcum, garlic, a whiff of the medicinal, the odor of scotch on a nervous tummy, rubbing alcohol. And it's so true of Humphrey. Um, he has another line in here where he says that Humphrey's syntax was so slovenly that it resembled a, uh, a, a freight train manager in a freight yard trying to find a freight car and has to move every single freight car in the train yard in order to find the one car that he needs. And that's the way he would shunt phrases around and never really, you know, his sentences didn't really come to any conclusion. 
And we have to get Nixon in. Yeah. My, my favorite was Nixon, Nixon standing with his hands in, cupped in front of him, looking like an old con appearing before the parole board. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> he said that he said that the the old Nixon uh, reminded him of a church usher who would catch a uh, a boy talking in church and would pull him out of the pew by his ear and once he got him outside he'd give the ear a twist. But but those descriptions the other thing about them is they're not just to show off, no. you know. You, especially for me rereading the essays. To read the Miami essay and to think about the Republican Party and what's looming, that, that Mailer, you know, Mailer ends with Reagan. He's, you know, and, and Reagan at that point is not the star, right? It's, it's Rockefeller, Nixon, Nixon gets the nomination. But he ends with Reagan, you know, almost sort of, even if he's not conscious of it, sensing that there's something there that might might take hold. And McGovern. Yeah. yeah he right. ends with Reagan and McGovern. He yeah. almost, he, he can feel it. That, that's, the, right. that's coming up. Yeah, he sees that McGovern comes in at the last minute and tries to steal votes from Gene McCarthy. And he does steal some as well because he's at, will, at least willing to talk. McCarthy would, would, wouldn't say anything. He said, you know my position. That's it. <laughs> That'll be it. You know? <laughs> And back up to the sem to the monastery in Minnesota, you know, uh, where we get up at five o'clock in the morning with the monks and say his prayers. So, wow, so funny. Um, wanted to know, what would you say Mailer's message would be for us today if he was here, you know, talking about this book, you know, what would you think his message would be? Well, I think he would talk about the fragility of democracy. He always said, he talked about it all the time. He was always worried about it. He said, you know, I grew up uh, and my mother talked about Hitler uh, and what Hitler was doing to the Jews in Europe. And she was, she said, you know, it can happen anywhere, it can happen anywhere. And oh, mom, you know, that was a long time ago. But he realized that, that democracy wasn't a given, that it was something that had to be tested and fought for. Blood had to be shed occasionally. I mean, who said that? Thomas Jefferson, uh, you know, the, the, the tree of liberty is, is nourished with the blood of patriots and so forth. Well, but that, that it, it required work that could slip away, that people could, that, that a, so, he, he always talked about a soft fascism coming to the United States that wouldn't look like, the, there wouldn't be jackboots in the street as in Europe, but there would be little by little an erosion of the powers of the press, of the powers of the courts, and so forth and so on. And he, so if, if he were here, that's exactly what he would say. You agree, Maureen? You're the, you're the expert, but yeah, I, I just, I, I can't imagine Mailer here, you know? I, I, I almost can't imagine him in this time um, with the shrinking of outlets for writing such as this, you know? And even maybe the shrinking of an audience for writing such as this. It's, it's hard for me to imagine him here. Don't you think that this, that, I mean, isn't there kind of a minor comeback of long form narrative now? Where people are writing, journalists who don't want just to do sound bites, that they're interested in doing the longer pieces. Have you thought of that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my station into investigative reporting. You know, they have a whole, you know, we're on your side. And like, literally, that is kind of the bread and butter. And and people actually watch four minute packages. And I'm like sitting there like, when is this gonna be over? I go to the bathroom, I come back. It's like, you know, but yeah, it's going that way. I wonder what Mailer would have thought about what he and those other new journalists unleashed on the world. You know, because I, I think sometimes people People think forms like this, that are sort of a mixture of novelistic techniques with journalism, that they, they've sort of opened the door to you know, what we live with now, truth is in truth, or there's so many kinds of truth, and it's all your, just your impression, and your impression differs from my impression, and they're equally valid. I, I think, um, I see it with my students, that they don't, 
they don't seem to respect the line between novelistic techniques and fact, and that it's all narrative. And I think that that's maybe an unfortunate legacy of new journalism. It's all narrative, so what does it matter? Well, but think of the gains too. You know, it used to be re reporters used to used to uh, write New York Times reporters. As, as, as I think Tom Wolfe said this. He said you would read their pieces, and it was like listening to the announcer of a tennis match, who had to speak in tones like this very carefully because they were out there serving the ball. And so you never had the voice of the of the writer was was lost. There was no room to to show off a little bit to to serve up a lot of metaphor. I mean, if you're interested in metaphor, there's more metaphor in this book. Mailer can't go more than a sentence or two to, without coming up with a metaphor. And, and a lot of times he misses, but most of the time he has a real gift for creating metaphor, and that illumines all of his subjects. Well, you know, metaphor, you could... Metaphor doesn't, didn't go with all-time journalism. I mean, you could use a metaphor now and then, maybe in the opening of your piece, but it, you couldn't ream your piece with a lot of different kinds of metaphor or, or dialogue or dramatic scenes. And I think those have been additions to journalism that, that have improved journalism. But now, you're right, some bad stuff is, might have come in this week. Yeah. Now, speaking of his voice, if he was here or... Speaking of it, huh? Maureen, I want you to uh, answer this if you can. What would he say today? Because, you know, you guys said you were trying to channel him earlier. They had it some wine. <laughs> I wish he were here today. I would love to. I would love to read what he would write about today's politics and t today's world. I... <sighs> I mean, I, 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 I can't imagine, but I would love to see, gosh, that's an unwritten piece, you know, that, that's almost worthy of some novelist attempting, you know, Norman Mailer's take on Donald Trump. I mean, that's who we're talking about. A lot of people have, have asked, I, I've, I've been asked that question 20 times, and it's, I've read innumerable pieces in which saying, I wonder what Mailer would say, I wonder what he would have to say. Well, you know, he knew Donald Trump because they both lived in New York. And he used to take, Trump had these black helicopters down on the west side in New York City on the river. And he would, these black helicopters, and they would shuttle people down to the Trump um, casinos. And they had boxing matches there. And Mailer used to get a free ride down and go to the boxing matches. So I know he knew Trump. This is, I've seen pictures of him. And I know Trump gave a thousand hotel rooms to the, uh, 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 the Penn Conference, the International Writers Conference in 1986. Gay Talese talked him into it. And, Trump gave him, and so on. So I knew, and Trump was always there. And if you lived in New York City, you read the New York papers, Trump was in the gossip columns constantly, all through the 80s and 90s. He was being quoted, or somebody was quoting him. There was, it was, uh, uh, you know, he had a lot of preparation for his tweeting. <laughs> now, we spoke about the metaphors. We spoke about his voice. What would you kind of say is your aha moment for everybody, or like you know, one most interesting or unique thing about this collection? Well, Mike read part of it in quoting from Denby. I mean, everybody who talks about Miami and the siege of Chicago talks about that moment where Mailer is, is waiting for Ralph Abernathy and he's tired of waiting. And He's saying to himself, and again, this was part, partly in the section that you read, Mike. Mm -hmm. He's saying, I'm tired of blacks and, and, um, and their, their demands. You know, I'm tired of, of their complaints. You know? And if I'm tired, how, how, do, how do people who aren't as, I mean, I don't think he'd like to call himself a liberal, but or aren't as somehow broad-minded, whatever, su supportive as me, how are those white folks feeling? And you know, what a, what's going to happen? What's going to set them off? I, I mean, that's, that's a moment that stops you cold if you haven't read this book in a while well, it's, or it, if you've it, never read it. They're waiting for Ralph Abernathy. Yeah. And he said he was tired of blacks being coming late to meetings. 
just because they, they, you know, they had been slaves, and now that they were free, they were going to show, the, show everybody, and they're going to come late. And he goes, all right, fine, but I'm getting tired of sitting here. And Abernathy came in uh, 45 minutes late, and there was uh, 100 reporters in the room. They were all waiting and so forth. And so that led to, he said, he got this thought in his head. He didn't know where it come from. He never thought of it before. And he goes, I'm getting tired of this. And that leads him to a whole riff on, well, I bet there's a lot of white people out there that I agree. And then, of course, George Wallace gets 10 million votes in the election, which in many ways is a, was a, he was a stalking horse for a lot of things that happened. But that section also makes me stop and think, too, who would write that today? No, and, no, and no, you know, I, I mean, yeah. what white writer would admit it? Would admit it? Right. Who wasn't completely, you know? Yeah, who wasn't a white extreme, supremacist, right? <laughs> ex, ex, you know, extreme, yeah. extreme right wing. Who who would admit that stuff? I mean, it was pretty. I, I, I imagine it was pretty. Um, Everybody, what, every shocking. review quoted about yeah. it. Every review brought it up. Yeah. And at the same time, he was saying, maybe Nixon has changed. Yeah. Maybe it doesn't seem like the old Nixon anymore. It looks like he's, he's learned a lot. He's had his punishment. He was, he, you know, he'd get defeated running for president. Then he'd get defeated. Remember, he'd lost the running for governor of California in 62. He lost that. He's learned his lesson. Maybe the new Nixon is going to be better. People, what, what's, what kind of, well, Mailer was always interrogating the, let's say, the standard positions. What is the standard position on what liberals, what their relationship should be with the black power movement? Supportive. We're all for it, right? He interrogates that. What, is, what, is, what do people feel about Richard Nixon? He was saying, well, look, I'm going to, look at his daughters. They're so beautiful. A man who could produce daughters like that, he can't be all bad. So he was looking for ways to, to, so he was always complicating the interrogation and not just going with the party line. I think that's part of his, that's part of his technique in everything he writes. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned Nixon's daughters because they and the Nixonettes and the Nixonaires, the cheerleaders, um, I think that's, it's, it's almost like reading Moby Dick and you see Ahab's wife and that's the last time a woman appears in all of Moby Dick. It, it, it really is startling again to, to read this book and to look at that landscape and realize, boy, we needed that second wave women's movement yes. Im immediately ASAP. You know, well, it was going on, but it's, it was going it's on, not but, here. But it, it it's hadn't not happened. in this, this book. This, this, this had kind of pushed everything off the map until it really got going in 1971. That's going to be the next book, the 70s. Mela's uh, books in the 70s. Yeah, that'll, be, that'll be interesting. Yeah. yeah, that will be interesting. Now we're going to open it up for questions to the audience. Anyone have any questions? Okay, sir, I'll come bring this over here. So what writer today would you suggest is closest to Mailer, particularly, and I know it's a tough question, but particularly because Mailer, in rereading these two books, uh, was obviously very participatory, you know, almost like uh, George Plimpton, you know, playing quarterback for the Detroit Lions. He makes his makes himself part of the fray. And is there a writer today who would equate that way, whether or not his or her writing style would match Mailer's? Thank you. It's a great question. I've, I've been thinking about writers today as I've been rereading this and thinking about well who. Not so much in in the um, fitting into the participatory role, but thinking about well, who tackles these big questions about America and does so with this kind of also irreverent sense of humor? And I think because it's the book I just finished reading, I I, I really recommend Gary Steingart, his new novel that's coming out in about a week, Lake Success, which is. Um, you know, it's an on-the-road novel. The main character is a guy who goes off uh, from New York into, into the Midwest and finally arrives in California. It's set in 2016, so Trump is there, but he hasn't won the election yet. And Steingart's character is, you know, kind of taking, taking assessing America. And, you know... It, Again, it's the most recent novel, so it's in my head, but that's one that I would say, and, and Steingart is a writer who I would say can do that. Dave Eggers. 
Dave Eggers is doing it. He's got a range of novels about America, all different aspects of it. Don DeLillo's doing it too, but he's getting up there. And DeLillo admits it, that he was stimulated. He said he read advertisements for myself, and if the book changed my life, I realized Mailer was taking on America. And Mailer actually wrote to him and says, you know, you're, you're, you're doing the stuff I was doing. You know, I'm, I'm getting ready to retire here, and you're, you're carrying it on. I think those two, definitely. Uh, Mailer, not only was a wonderful writer but, uh, and witness, but um, a, what we don't have anymore, I don't think, and he was a public intellectual. In those days, you know, there were, you would see on even television, James Baldwin, Gore Vidal, uh, William F. Buckley, you know, Susan Sontag, and they were self-promoting in a way, but they also promoted the issues and their ideas and talked about things in a much more complex way. Now we just have pundits. Why, why do you think there's been that change? Well, we also have ta Coates, who I think occupies that space. You know, he, he, he talks about ideas. He talks a lot about race in, in a way that's meant to be accessible to a wide audience and not to just speak to the converted. So we've got David Frum, who I think is a fabulous writer um, and political writer, but he also weighs in on culture. And, you know, he's from the right. And um, so we still have some of those folks, but I don't, I don't, think, I don't think they have the large personalities that some of the, the, uh, the figures who you mentioned did. did. Uh, when uh, when Mailer uh, debated William Buckley in Chicago, 1962 at Medina Temple, it was on the front page of the New York Times above the fold. Gay Talese wrote the story. I can't imagine any two writers debating and, and getting a front page of uh, a national newspaper. I just don't think it could happen anymore. But that, you know, 10,000 people went to see that debate in 1962. And, you know, it was reprinted and so forth and so on. I mean, Buckley and uh, Sontag, I mean, we're, we're out there all the time. And Vidal as well. Uh, and they... I think it was just a, a, a generation that came through, and we, you know we're going to have to wait, you know, till the comet comes again. Uh, it's it's just it it just happened. When was the time before that? You'd have to go back to the twenties, I think, to Mencken and Edmund Wilson and and people like that. Um, you know, Dorothy Parker. Because you don't. I, I mean, yeah, I agree. Those 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 writers are there, but they don't. A lot of people know who's that guy again. Uh, you know, they're not, well, whereas everyone knew who Norman Mailer was. Everyone knew who Gore Vidal was. You know, you couldn't go on a talk show without, he was on every talk show under the sun. And also, we don't have Dick Cavett anymore. And Cavett had all of these people on, and he, I don't think that anybody bested him as a talk show host uh, for excellence. I, I don't think, I mean, there were a lot of great ones, but I, I think he was, he was uh, in a class by himself. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, speaking of Kevin, <laughs> are you aware, as someone who's promised a favor, if there's an archive of the shows yes. that Buck, like Buckley, Vidal, yep. and when I, I remember seeing yeah. uh, You can see the most of them are on YouTube. Yeah. Dick Cavett is all over, and there I, I know uh, a guy that was Dick Cavett's... Uh, he was amazing. Yeah, those all you can get all those. Yeah, you can watch them again, and they're really something. <laughs> they're really something because they changed the rules of the talk show. You know, it used to be people come on and talk about their new movie or their new book or you know something like that. Where you going on your vacation? And uh, then all of a sudden, you know, you had them circling their chairs around and Mailer here and all the others, Dick Cavett and Vidal and Janet Flanner turning their chairs around, and the audience roaring. And, Mailer standing up and saying, now which side, how many people are on my side? <laughs> if Mailer were here, he'd be asking for a vote right now. He'd, he'd want you to vote on something. You know, how many people want this and how many people think this is good or this bad? And that was his way of always in the audience of getting on. I saw him speak many times. And he was lousy when he first started, but he learned over the years how to work an audience and how to really get them going. And he always started by asking some kind of a quiz or taking some kind of a poll. Okay. Yes? There's a chapter in the book, 
Yeah. Well, Mela had a, um, yeah, he had a, he had a, a very uh, complex view of, of policemen. And he thought it was a very difficult job because the, the temptations to use your power were so great. And it, it, all, any of the uh, nefarious evil influences you had in you were bound to come out if you were in positions of power. But he also felt that when a policeman was good, when they were excellent, uh, that uh, you know, th that it was a remarkable thing and it could really vitalize the community. And he, when he ran for mayor of New York, he went and he gave uh, talks at the police academy. And they were all sitting there like this. And he got into long discussions about what he thought about police. And, you know, and there were a lot of nods. He won a lot of votes over by doing that. He also said that Eugene McCarthy looked like the police commissioner of a police force that was too good to exist. So... I do, I liked him, and Mailer did like him. But Mailer wanted him to get out and grab that opportunity by the throat, and McCarthy just wouldn't do it. It was this, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas, or you know, uh, he just could not put himself forward. Yes. <laughs> so, um, I have a question. Um, he, he refers to himself as the reporter throughout the book. Uh, could you talk a little bit about, was that to emphasize he was standing as a witness, or why did he do that? Why, why did he choose to do that? Well, when he started uh, writing uh, the new journalism, he, got, he didn't want to keep saying, I, 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 I. He found it to be uh, intrusive and difficult. And he was looking for a way to talk about his own stake in events and his own participation in events without sounding like an, so much like an egotist. He knew he, he sounded like an egotist anyway, so he was trying to dampen that effect and began describing himself in the third person. And so in every one of his books, he had a different name. This was the reporter. He called himself also Aquarius. Uh, sometimes it was just Norman Mailer. Uh, sometimes it was the Beast, uh, the Acolyte. He had eight or nine different names, and he wrote seven books uh, from 68 to 75 in the third person. And, you know, it's kind of a rare technique. I have my students do it once in a while, write a, about a piece in the third person, put themselves in the story and uh, instead of using I. And it, they say you, you learn, you get a different sense of yourself. You know, you're look, looking at yourself from a distance. And that's what he wanted to do. It's a very successful technique, but it's only used very rarely. You know, uh, Gertrude Stein used it, and Henry Adams used it most famously, and that's where Mailer learned it. Julius Caesar used it, Xenophon, you know, the Greeks. Uh, but it was, it's, it's very rarely used, but when it is used, it can be great. Go on for Maureen. Hi. Now, all the people you named had such, such tiny egos, too. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I have a, a writer here who, you want rough and tumble in your face, let's talk about it, and I, I, I'll give you a prize if you finish the book, The Sellout by Paul Beatty. Now there's a guy, he's talking straight, using all the languages, I, I know the whole, and he, and he does it in the first person, and he won the Pulitzer, yeah. and there are plenty of those guys out there. Nobody, only reason I'd be reading this book is because it was book club, and I, ha I have to admit, I went and got the audio, so I, I'm not kidding. I mean, I have an MBA. I'm an educated person. I had to sit there with the book and listening to the audio going through the book. I mean, metaphor, every other, every other sentence. It, but they're out there. Yeah. And yeah. he's now, not, not that I know he's not that well read because the Chicago Public Library Usually if a book's popular or moving, you know, there's 500 people waiting to get the book. Well, he's on shelves in every branch in the city. So no, but I mean, it's like no problem. <laughs> so people aren't even, they aren't interested in it. They don't want to hear about it, I don't think. They, I mean, this guy talked straight about the whole situation of, of the America, American scape of race. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Um, I was rereading the book this weekend, and I was struck, as, as you both mentioned, um, that Mailer was one of the first 
people to take Ronald Reagan seriously and, and that he was a coming force. I wonder if you think that's because at the moment that Mailer was starting to experiment in films, this was when he made Maidstone, and if his involvement in the film made him appreciate Reagan's past as an actor and what it could mean. I know Mike and I, when we were talking before we came over here, we were struck by every comparison that Mailer makes is a comparison to an actor uh, to theater, you know, all of the candidates are compared even jokingly to, you know, like high school theater. Nixon, Nixon would have been the despair of his high school drama teacher because he, had, he moves with those stick-like movements. So there's some, there is something going on where he seems to be evaluating the, the candidates and how they project themselves, how they act. And, you know, Reagan was the great communicator, right? And, and Mailer had seen his movies. You know, Mailer grew up in the 30s and went to the movies in Brooklyn every single week. And he knew all these movies. He said, Humphrey Bogart doesn't seem like an actor. He seems like my uncle. I know, I, I know Humphrey Bogart so well. He's like my uncle. I, I, feel, I feel that kind of a closeness to him. And so, you know, he compares Kennedy to, he said, well, Kennedy was kind of aloof, you know, the kind of the way that uh, uh, Gregory Peck is aloof. So he had this... That was one of his uh, one of his metaphor banks was with were, were film, and he could talk about Edward G. Robinson and Jimmy Cagney, all of that. He he was conversing with, and of course he knew he knew uh, uh, Ronald Reagan as the Gipper, and as the guy who never got the girl. And so you know he he would he would draw on that, and he wrote about Reagan later on as well, uh, and he was never really um, a big fan of Reagan's. But he thought Reagan was a, you know, a brilliant uh, presenter of self, knew how to handle his, his image as well as anybody in American politics. You mentioned earlier um, about the forum for all these wonderful discussions. Those were the days where there were three major networks. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, and I think it's obvious, the fragmentation of the media. There's so many sources, so many voices out there. Um, you know. I, could there be another mailer again? Because, and to this woman's point, how do you find out about all these people who are writing these amazing treatises when the print's disappearing? And if you're not on the right tweet or wherever. NPR. I, well, I go to NPR <laughs> and I get the New York Times and I get the New Yorker, but it's just not the same. I think the media has played a big impact on how we understand the world around us. It's, I, I try to think about writers who the average American, whoever that is, knows even if they, they know the name, even if they've never read them. Like, I, you know, I, I know my, my dad, who certainly never read Mailer, that he knew the name. Like, who today? And, and, it, and it's hard. I, um, yeah, James, maybe the genre writers, and I'm a, you know, I'm a great fan of mystery writers, so I'm not sneering at that at all, but um, I, I think maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe we have to go to the genre writers. Um, and maybe, maybe there's going to be a reaction setting in. I mean, after all, people, I'm reading now that all of a sudden people are dropping off Twitter and, you know, they're losing... You get tired of it. Maybe this is a great period of everybody had a lot to say and they're going to put their pictures up and what they had for lunch up and all that kind of stuff. Maybe we're just, it's just going to wear itself out after a time and there'll be a, a consolidation again. Um, I think that's very possible that that's going to happen. It, but it'll be different. It won't be a return to the old. It'll be something we can't imagine today where there will be writers like that again. I would love to see that happen, but I don't think I'm going to live long enough. Uh, since you both do some teaching, uh, I wondered, is Mailer taught widely in academia? Are young people exposed to his writing? And uh, do they get a sense of him? or, or what, what, he, uh, he doesn't have a book like The Great Gatsby or, or uh, Harper Lee, To Kill a Mockingbird, or a separate piece. He doesn't have a short novel that everybody is going to read. You know, that just his books are are long, difficult, and, and, and uh, in many cases, and they're topical. The one that I've seen uh, taught the most recently, and I've, been, I've done a lot of Skyping 
to several schools that are teaching it, is his book about the fight in Africa called The Fight. Because it's a short book. It's got Muhammad Ali in it. It's, it, it, it only covers a period of a, of a couple of months. And it really focuses on the fight and, how, and, and on Ali, but also on Foreman and how Ali did it and how he became, well, is there ever, any, is there ever going to be anybody like him again? Uh, in American life. I mean, it was a time when uh, more people knew who Muhammad Ali was than any other person in the world. And now, you know, I know I've got grandchildren. I'll go, do you know Muhammad Ali? And they go, who? They don't know who he is. So, you know, fame is, fl is fleeting. And, um, go ahead. Yeah. Well, no. You know, Mike and I met each other when I uh, did a conference at Georgetown years ago, 2007. Uh, Honor, honoring the 40th anniversary of the March on the Pentagon. And I invited Mike to come and, and speak about Armies of the Night. Mailer was going to come, yeah. but, but he, he, was, he was ill. And yeah, he was did, dying. Yeah. He was dying, didn't, didn't make it. But um, I sort of had to sell that conference as uh, a history conference rather than talking about Armies of the Night, which I think is one of the great American books, because... Mailer is a hard sell, you know, and, and students, when I do read Armies of the Night with them, as I do in some of the courses I teach, I teach a course on public intellectuals in America, so, um, and we read Mailer, we read Armies of the Night, but it's, students are so used to, these days, reacting to things just based on political correctness, like, that's their first response. So if Mailer says something misogynist, racist, whatever, that's, that's what they're going to uh, quickly gravitate to and, and want to stay with. And it, it takes a while to sort of pull them back and say, you know, as Mike beautifully explained, you know, Mailer's, Mailer's sort of thinking things out in his writing. So he's not landing at these places necessarily. But he's, think, he's, he's sort of giving us a, a view into his thought processes, and you've got to stay with him. He, he's, he's tough. They don't, they like some of his humor. They think he goes on way too long, and they think that he's, um, he's not woke. <laughs> he's showing the contents of his mind. I mean, he's walking through contemporary life and he's responding to it and he's thinking about, well, this reminds me of this and this reminds me of that and what about this and what about that? And, and the things he says in one book, he may contradict in the next book. So uh, he's like us. I mean, we don't, we're, not, we're not always completely consistent in how we feel about things and over a period of time we change. And he's showing us the, 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 really the current, it really is like a stream of consciousness almost of his thought of how he responds to different things. And it can be very engaging, but unless you know where you're going and it is set up right, uh, I've taught him for many years uh, off and on, and it, it is difficult, although the naked and the dead is easy. Uh, students can read that and they can appreciate it because it's kind of, you know, uh, dead end realism and naturalism, and, and it's a war story, and it's uh, it's it's still very powerful. He wrote it when he was 23, and it was published when he was 25. And you can read that, and there are a number of his short stories that are pretty good. Uh, so you have you have to be very selective in what you get them into. But once they get hooked, I found you know I mean. We have a Norman Mailer Society. We meet every year. We have about 100 people come. And a lot of them are young academics. And is Maggie McKinley here? There she is. There's the pre she's the president of the Norman Mailer Society. I'm the ex-president. And she is, represents a generation of new academics who are teaching Norman Mailer. Uh, and they come to the conference. And we've had panels on te teaching Norman Mailer, the problems of teaching Norman Mailer. Right, Maggie? Now we're going to take one more question and uh, kind of wrap things up. You. Yeah, well, well, what I was going to say is I, I agree with the lady who talked about the fragmentation of the media, but I think a bigger problem these days, which drives me absolutely crazy, is at one time for a writer to get known, they had to have a publisher they or be on a major network. In other words, they had to be vetted to some extent. Now the noise and the sheer volume out there, anybody, any idiot, any so-called pundit can self-publish something, spread it over the internet, tweet about it, 
and he's got 10 gazillion, gazillion hits. And the next thing you know, how the hell do you differentiate him from an up-and-coming Norman Mailer? That's, I think, the biggest problem these days is the noise, the level of the noise and the sheer volume. And I don't know what we do about that. I agree. Well, I, I think you're being way too optimistic about self-published <laughs> authors. <laughs> Most, most outlets don't review them, and, um, you know, it, it, it's, the, it's the rare self-published author who really breaks through. My, my biggest uh, moment of surprise when I was serving as a Pulitzer Prize juror was when I realized that if you're self-published, you can nominate yourself for the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> and so then if you pay to have a second edition of your self-published novel, published, you can put on it, nominate it for the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> what have I just done? <laughs> well, let's thank Maureen and Mike. And, and thank you all. Now, they will be